Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to Michigan's new expungement laws. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lori Berman, Vice President of Membership and Development for the Small Business Association of Michigan. A couple housekeeping matters before we get started. If you have questions, I encourage you to use the Q&A app, the chat in Zoom or on Facebook. We'll be watching for your questions. The slides and the video from today's recording will be available to you. We'll send the slides out after today's webinar. You'll find both the slides and the webinar recordings on the site of the Small Business Association of Michigan, as well as on our Facebook page. Okay. Oh, also, if you have questions unrelated to today's content, other questions for SBAM regarding loans, et cetera, please don't ask those today. Please do send those to our SBAM account, sbam at sbam.org. Let's get going. I would like to uh, first introduce our speakers and thank the partnership that we have today. We are very, very pleased to have the representatives from Safe and Just Michigan here today presenting this information to you, sharing the information. Uh, this is really pertinent information, especially as it pertains to our small business owners that are struggling to find talent. A uh, very important issue that we would like to bring you up to speed on. So without further ado, I will introduce you to John Cooper. John is the executive director of Safe Adjust Michigan. He's responsible for the organization's strategic vision and direction. John joined the Safe and Just Michigan in 2017 as their policy director. After serving a criminal justice policy as advice, after serving as criminal justice policy advisor to state representative David Legrand. John's research and advocacy is focused on Michigan's adult criminal legal system with an emphasis on strategies to reduce Michigan's prison population, remove barriers to sex successful re-entry, and increase the use of effective alternatives to incarceration. John, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we'll leave it to you to introduce the rest of your panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lori. And uh, thanks everyone um, at SBAM for um, including us in this and the audience for joining. Uh, we, we think the expungement is a critically important issue. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk throughout the presentation about how many people in Michigan will be affected by the new laws that were passed and you'll be surprised by what the numbers are. Um, so I'm joined here today by two of my colleagues from Safe and Just Michigan. Josh Ho is our policy analyst and Rick Speck is our outreach director. Um, Rick is himself a small business owner and has experience with second chance hiring. So I, I wanted to specifically include Rick for his perspective on some of these issues. But as Lori points out, um, uh, expungement is a really critically important piece of maximizing the available workforce in Michigan and also um, improving public safety. What we see in the sociological research around employment is that employment is the single most important tool to reducing future recidivism among people that have been in, in trouble. And um, that's an area where small business owners can really, really benefit their communities is by seeing opportunities to um, give people a second chance or in, in other cases, a first chance and helping them develop a career, um, build a career and um, make the income they need to take care of themselves and their families. Um, so I've got our slides here and I'm gonna just start screen sharing a minute um, so we can get started. Uh, Josh is going to um, kick off with the discussion of some of the um, barriers that people face from old criminal records and also um, give you some statistics about the scope of the problems that we're trying to solve with expungement reform. So here we go. Hi, I'm Josh Ho. I'm a policy analyst at Safe and Just Michigan. My job today is to let you know about the background behind the recent expansion of Michigan's expungement laws. So first, what is an expungement? But probably a good question to answer off the bat. In Michigan, expungement is, is actually called a set-aside, 
which means that the record still technically exists and can be used by law enforcement, but is not made available to the public. Prior to the passage of this new expungement law, people in Michigan could expunge up to one felony and two misdemeanors. The new laws expand what can be considered in many ways, and John and I will be telling you more about that later in our presentations. So why did Michigan decide to change its expungement laws? Well, the first set of reasons deals with the massive collateral consequences criminal records have on formerly incarcerated people and their families. As you see from the slide, a massive number of people are impacted by criminal records, and those impacts have very large costs for Michigan's workforce and economy. As the chief investment strategist for Fifth Third Bank, Jeffrey Krasenik, explained in his new book, Untapped Talent, our deepest and broadest labor opportunity comes from the ranks of those underemployed because of a criminal record. He also suggested that, based on historical precedent, our labor force participation rates adjusted for age and sex suggest that our unusual social ills have sapped the labor force of the workers we would need to supply two or three years of additional growth at our baseline pace. Multiply those years of forsaken growth by the value of a year's GDP, and those years worth of missing workers equates to around $1 trillion in forsaken growth, not someone else's trillion, ours. Probably the biggest reason we were concerned with this is because criminal records and the collateral consequences from criminal records generate what I often refer to as radical insecurity. If you think about it, the most important things in our lives are ensuring safe and secure housing, having employment, a livable wage, and strong community connections. This is doubly true of people coming back from being involved with our criminal justice system, having a good place to sleep, being able to feel part of your community and having some money in your pocket generates safety and is the opposite of insecurity. In particular, a criminal record can result in a large number of people becoming uh, housing insecure, unemployed. They can have a lot of effect on our safety and security. As John said at the very beginning of this, one of the best ways we have of ensuring, uh, uh, ensuring safety in our communities is using processes like expungement. I know when I came home from incarceration, it seemed almost impossible to imagine returning to a world of housing or having a good job. Most landlords excluded formerly incarcerated people and only a few properties in my entire county would allow formerly incarcerated people to rent. Every time I went for a job interview, I could almost predict the moment when the interview would change, where the whole tenor would change. The interviewer would be looking over the application, come to the place where I checked the box that I had a felony record, and then everything would speed up and soon I'd be back on my way out knowing full well there was not a job in my future. Having people who come back into the community and remain crime-free over a period of time, but still remain radically insecure does not promote safety and certainly does not help our economy here in Michigan. In Detroit alone, Michigan's recent expansion of expungement laws will allow 206,000 people who are previously ineligible to apply for an expungement. John, could you change the slide? A second problem with Michigan's previous system of expungement was the problem of uptake or the amount of people taking advantage of available expungement opportunities. As I mentioned before, prior to the passage of the current package, Michigan had a working expungement process, but it had several problems. First, the process was very limited. Huge numbers of people were being impacted with criminal records and more and more people were being added every year. But despite these growing numbers, only 3000 expungements were being granted annually. And change the slide. So what was included in the old system and what made it so clunky and slow on the uptake? Well, first, Expungement only worked if you had no more than one felony or two misdemeanors on your record. And the way our criminal justice system works tends to favor, uh, even with plea bargains, people having multiple felony and misdemeanor charges in the same document. Uh, applications were and often are complex and resource intensive. Applications must be filed uh, in the convicting court, regardless of where someone lives at the time of application for an expungement. That can be a huge barrier for a lot of folks who, you know, who, who sometimes struggle even to get back and forth to work, much less travel to other counties and things like that. The costs are also very high. The cost of an application ran around $150 without a lawyer and as much as 10 times that much with a lawyer. You had to submit multiple copies of a complex application 
the judge could and often did often deny your appeal for expungement. And before you even got to being in front of the judge, you had to get fingerprinted and return to a court, a place for people who've been directly impacted that can be very traumatic for them. Uh, this can be a real psychological barrier for many directly impacted people. Finally, the processing time for processing the background check and paperwork generally ran around six months in most courts, which is a pretty long period of time. I should mention here that as John will discuss later, the petition process was expanded in, our, in the current legislative package that was recently passed. And that process was altered in some ways, which might make uptake more likely compared to what happened in the previous system. You can change the slide. So why else has this process failed? Another of the major reasons that this has failed is that many of the crimes that are most likely to give someone a criminal record were excluded from the possibility of expungement. For instance, traffic offenses, which represented 50% of all criminal cases in Michigan, were, were excluded from consideration right off the bat. Uh, you can change the slide. So a final impetus for why Michigan changed its expungement process involved two academic studies. First, there was a study by uh, two researchers, Nakamura and Blumstein, which found that over time, people with criminal records who refrain from committing new crimes over a period of time actually became statistically safer than people in the general population who had never even committed a crime before. Second, here in Michigan, research by Sonia Starr and J.J. Prescott, who are at the University of Michigan Law School was published. This research was particularly significant because they were able to use de-identified data from actual felony expungements in Michigan cross-referenced with employment data. And what they found was that expungements promote economic productivity and likely improve public safety. They concluded that policymakers should maximize expungement and include automation and that is exactly what happened last October. But John will tell you more about that in a few minutes. Change the slide, please. So now that we've answered the question of why change was needed, Michigan changed the process in two ways. First, it greatly expanded the petition process for expungement. And second, it created an automatic expungement process. So how did we get to automatic expungement? Well, as the result of the tireless work of a, of a group of folks at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, uh, over six years in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania became the first state to pass an automatic record sealing law in 2018. So how did it work? An algorithm that is coded to statutory eligibility criteria for record sealing runs a monthly search of the state's official criminal history database and routes the list of eligible records to the courts for processing. The courts then issue an omnibus record sealing order that seals all eligible records and issues a record sealing notice to other state record keepers. Until now, as you can see, most of these laws only applied to non-conviction and low-level misdemeanors. I'm sure John will be telling you more about how this works during his presentation. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll now turn things back over to John. Thanks, Josh. And I'm, I'm going to hand the uh, screen sharing of the presentation off to Josh uh, so I can, can look at my notes. Um, but I, I want to pause briefly here and highlight a couple things. So first, there are um, 80 million people nationwide with criminal records. There are about 3 million in Michigan. And this is simply a fact of the um, expansion of the criminal justice system within our society over the last 50 years. And I, I think it's important to understand that most people with criminal records have committed low level misdemeanor offenses. That's about 80% of the convictions that come out of our courts every year. A disproportionate number of those are traffic offenses, which have never been eligible to expungement until April 11 of this year. So there's a massive accumulation of people with public records, but the way we think about public records has not changed since the 60s. And that was a time when many, many fewer people had criminal records. And also there was much, much less access to them. Employers did not do background checks as a matter of course, and now essentially all do. Um, so criminal records have a much, much more significant impact on a person's ability to get jobs and housing. Um, so the system for expungements needed to change because it was only serving about 3000 people a year when we have more like 3 million people statewide with these records. 
And, um, you know, the, the court process simply cannot be scaled out in a way that could meet that need. We could get every lawyer in the state working in every court, and we would never seal 3 million records. There needs to be a different system, and that was really the impetus for looking at the automatic system in addition to the traditional one. Um, but in talking about um, barriers, I, I think it's really important to sort of put a practical uh, human perspective on it. And for that purpose, uh, I want to bring on Rick Speck, uh, who, who runs our outreach function at Safe and Just Michigan. Rick has a really interesting personal history and I think a really unique perspective on these issues because he's someone who has experience with the justice system, but also has experience working in reentry as a peer mentor to people who are coming out of the system. And he's also a small business owner. And so Rick, I, I, I wanna just hand it off to you and let you talk a little bit about um, your business, your experience um, reentering and also um, providing reentry services to people and, and the ways in which criminal records have impacted people's ability to succeed in the community. Thank you, John. Um, yes, as John mentioned, uh, unfortunately I served 15 years. Um, I've been home just over seven years now. And it was a lot of the same barriers that folks are dealing with today in, in relation to having felony convictions and a history uh, that was preventing me from getting gainful employment at a livable wage. I have a skill as a painter, so I already had a trade. Um, and even though um, I have had the trade when I was released, I still couldn't get hired. Um, I mean, the reality was, as I was being interviewed, other folks were being interviewed with me that didn't have felony histories. And, you know, consequently, I, I just wasn't getting hired. So I, I started out to start doing painting on my own more out of a necessity to meet those basic needs um, than John talked about. And, you know, oftentimes transportation is a big barrier, understanding bus routes and how to get to places, uh, technology, you know, folks just simply trying to apply for positions online can, can sometimes be challenging. Um, at least it was for me and the clients that I've worked with over the past several years. Um, but I've also found, you know, the most rewarding work is with those same folks that had those same challenges. And, and I think housing uh, stability is probably um, one of the, the biggest factors that help folks, um, is, as Josh mentioned earlier, with radical insecurity. Um, when you have a place that's safe to uh, come home to after a long day's work and get prepared for the next day, you know, it's oftentimes um, a lot easier, a lot less anxiety. Um, and so for me, housing um, is probably one of the largest barriers that folks face uh, coming home that um, can put their, their employment at the forefront. Hey, Rick. Um... One of the really, I think, important findings in the research is that people who stay out of trouble for five years or more are very unlikely to get into trouble again. And this is a finding that came out of the University of Michigan study and also earlier criminological studies of rearrest rates and the like. And, you know, I think for some people who are not familiar with hiring people who have gotten into trouble, this might not make a lot of sense. Can you share your perspective on um, how these dynamics play out in an individual person's life and what your experience has been hiring people with criminal records? Well, for me, um, I, I've been very fortunate out of the several years that I've been in business. I primarily only hire folks uh, that were formerly incarcerated. So all of my, pretty much all of my hires with the exception of two have all been second chance hires. And uh, probably the most rewarding piece for it is um, their eagerness to learn. And, you know, in, in a few cases over the years, um, you know, they've, they've learned and developed and started their own business and, you know, left uh, my business and, and still in partnership had a, a project I just wrapped up with a guy that worked with me for a number of years who's off doing his own thing. And I mean, that's just as rewarding because now he is also doing second chance hiring. And, you know, 
having folks that are coming home and you give them this chance, I mean, I, I, I can't kind of put into words the gratitude that folks feel and that they got this second chance, that they are employed. And for me, my experience is, that, you know, they show up on time, they work harder than, than the couple of folks that I have hired that have not been formally incarcerated. Um, I get, you know, all of my clients, you know, love my guys, the professionalism, the willingness to do extra, go out of the way. I mean, which all bodes well for me as a business owner because it gives me a great reputation of how I service my clients. And that's directly related to the folks that I hire, which again, are all formally incarcerated. Um, one of the things I think that's really important in the empirical research we see is that criminal activity is concentrated among men in their late teens um, and early twenties. And what we see in the second chance hiring um, market is a lot of times there are guys that have spent some time in the system or have been on probation for a while and they've managed to start a family, they've settled down with somebody, they, they're not getting into trouble anymore. Um, does that line up with your own experience hiring people? Because um, the, the data I've seen shows that recidivism rates really go down like this after sort of your mid-20s. and. From my perspective, that makes a lot of sense because people tend to be settling down themselves. Yeah, no, I would definitely uh, agree with that. And, and for the younger folks, because I did mentor and work with a lot of younger folks, what was interesting in, in my personal experience working with them is when you could get them involved in something, you know, I, as we would work towards getting them employment, we looked at it like, let's get you a paid internship. Let's get you into a field that you're interested in, that you could see yourself either career-wise or developing your own business after the same model. And when they had that, something to grab onto that was associated with employment, again, the, their uh, response, their maturity, how they responded um, to family situations, all improved dramatically because they had this goal. They wanted to get to work. They wanted to be, right? And so even for the younger people, having that job security, that good feeling of, you know, putting in a good day's work and getting paid for it, that, that was pretty significant with younger folks, but definitely with, with older folks. Um, but I think too, that we can do uh, things as small business owners with simply letting folks know that we do do second chance hires. Because a lot of times folks don't apply for jobs because they feel like, hey, they're probably not going to hire me anyway. I, I applied at a business similar to this before. They wouldn't hire me for my record. So why would I apply at a different one? Right. And so we can do that as business owners. Let, um, let the community know that, that we're open to second chance hires. Yeah, that actually is really important. We, we hear frequently from people with records that they, they've put out a 30 or 50 or 100 applications and just gotten nothing out of it. And so, you know, finding industries and employers that are actively doing second chance hiring is really important to people. Um, th there is a pipeline in certain places. West Michigan has a really good coalition of organizations that are doing great work around second chance hiring. I know there's many businesses in Metro Detroit that are as well. But a lot of the, um, the culture of the business community is skeptical or hesitant on second chance hiring. And the best advocates for change within the business community are members of the business community. And so, you know, if, if this is an area where you have had good experiences, please tell your colleagues and help them understand the things you've done to have success with hiring, with second chance hiring, um, because it is really important. You know, it's, it's, it's good for business people and it's also good for communities and public safety. You know, it really is a win-win and that's important for people to understand. Um, the other thing I'll say before I jump into the details of the Clean Slate campaign in Michigan and the new laws that have been passed and legal resources uh, to help take advantage of them, um, I, I think it's really important to point out that the expungement um, law reflects the research on desistance. That means if you stop 
engaging in criminal activity for a number of years, you're unlikely to get back into it. That was already built into the statutes. There was a five-year waiting period from the end of a person's probation or parole or sentence um, that was in the original law and that has been preserved in the reforms and that is evidence-based. So um, with that, I'm gonna screen share again. I, I, I think we had a little bit of a challenge getting the slides to work for Josh so I can do it. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's see, can you guys, okay. So um, the Michigan Clean Slate campaign launched in early 2019. Um, we were the um, coordinating organization for the campaign in the state, but you know, I think the, the partners within the campaign had a lot to do with its success. The SBAM was among many members of the business community that supported the Clean Slate laws, I think for reasons we've already talked about. Uh, SBAM was joined by Detroit, Grand Rapids, Saginaw, Lansing Chambers. Um, the state chamber came on board after some changes in the house, along with the bankers and manufacturers associations. And uh, it was a broad bipartisan coalition of support. Um, it included sort of traditional inside groups in Lansing and also outside grassroots groups. And uh, as you can see from this timeline here, um, once the bills were introduced in September of 2019, they moved quite quickly through the House. There were really um, strong bipartisan majorities in support of these bills throughout. You can see it was 95 to 13 votes in the House. Um, things got slowed down in the Senate to work around a number of issues, um, largely related to implementation and some of the technical criteria that needed to be met to make the automatic work. But um, they, they did hearings um, in June after the legislature restarted on Zoom during the, the pandemic and eventually moved the bills out. And uh, the House and the Senate agreed on the changes. In September, the governor signed these bills in October and they became effective um, in April. So I'm gonna focus on the expansion of eligibility to petition for expungement here because the automatic expungement that was passed is not gonna be effective for a couple of years. The reason for that is that um, many local courts in Michigan um, have different case management systems and not all those case management systems can talk to the state police criminal history database in the way they need to in order to implement the law. So there's some system upgrades that need to happen before the law can be implemented. That's all technologically feasible and will get done on time. Um, but th they, they needed to be a bit of a lag in effective date for the automatic. So with the expansion of eligibility and uh, Josh mentioned that over 200,000 people in Wayne County alone will be newly eligible to apply for expungement as a result of these changes. And just to put that in perspective, that's 15% of the Wayne County population is newly eligible to apply for expungement. Um, and about a total of 25% uh, of Wayne County's population um, has records that are eligible to be expunged. Um, I, I don't think I've mentioned yet that certain kinds of convictions are not eligible for expungement, but, but I should probably do that. That includes any crime punishable by life in prison. It includes all sex offenses. It includes um, second offense, domestic violence, human trafficking, and, and a number of others. So the expungement law is targeted at um, your mid and lower level criminal convictions. I think the other thing to understand is that because so many people have criminal convictions and so many convictions are lower level, a person having a criminal conviction or even a felony conviction doesn't mean they went to prison, doesn't even necessarily mean they went to jail. Um, what it means is they got in trouble and there was a judgment issued by a court that the person had committed a crime, but the associated punishment in many cases is going to be a short stint in jail, probation, or a fine. Um, for the most serious felonies, people go to prison for a very long time in Michigan. Um, but there really is a dichotomy between a lot of the resources in the justice system and a lot of the numbers of people affected are on the lower end of things. And I think that's, that's a big part of the policy problem that this package was trying to solve. 
Um, so here, the specific changes that were made, there's really five groups. Uh, the first group is around expanding the number of convictions that are eligible to be sealed. As Josh mentioned, the original law, which was created in the 60s, capped eligibility to apply for expungement at no more than one felony or two misdemeanors. So people with three misdemeanors couldn't apply to have any felony expunged, no matter how old it was. If you had two felonies you picked up um, in, in the same uh, arrest, you can't apply to expunge those or anything else on your record. So it was a very rigid and narrow criteria. And that created problems for people who have stayed out of trouble for years. So the legislature wanted to open up eligibility in a variety of ways. The new standards are up to three felonies can be expunged. There's no formal limit on misdemeanors, um, but uh, you can't get more than two assaultive crimes expunged. You can't get repeat offenses expunged. Um, number of more serious convictions aren't eligible, as I mentioned. And also all of these um, cases are ultimately going to be decided by a judge. So if someone has a very, very long record and the judge just has concerns about that person's ability to stay out of trouble, the judge does have the discretion to deny these petitions still. And ultimately the legislature felt that it was important for there to be um, a human involved with a broader process. So the automatic process is, is narrower in its eligibility because there's not a judge ultimately making the decision. Um, in addition to expanding the eligibility, a number of convictions eligible, they introduced a transactional counting rule that's designed to address a situation where a person gets multiple charges from a single arrest. Um, so that's on now, but the, the more, most serious crimes are not eligible for that. Um, there's new waiting periods that make it possible for a person to apply for misdemeanor expungement after three-year waiting period. There's longer ones for more complex records and more serious convictions. Um, I, I think the biggest impact in terms of numbers is going to be around traffic offenses. As, as we mentioned earlier, half of all criminal cases in Michigan are traffic cases. And because traffic offenses were never eligible for expungement until April 11 of this year, there's a huge backlog of people with traffic cases on their records that they were not previously able to, to expunge. Um, so that's gonna be a major, major component of the newly eligible, eligible people. Um, finally, um, marijuana misdemeanors. There, there's a special process that was created in order to expunge misdemeanor marijuana convictions that um, relate to conduct that's now legal after the recreational marijuana ballot initiative. Um, that in some other states, they've put expungements into um, legalization ballot initiatives, but in Michigan, we have rules about the number of different code sections that can be changed through a voter-initiated law. And because of that, the folks that worked on the ballot initiative didn't want to include expungements because they felt like that would create legal problems for them. So the, there needed to be legislative work on marijuana expungements. And um, the estimates I've seen uh, project about 200,000 people to benefit from that particular law. Um, the automatic expungement that was passed, I'm going to go through quickly, but it is important to know about. Um, so right now, this law is scheduled to be effective April 11, 23. And what that does is it says for lower level convictions, um, people are going to have eligible convictions sealed automatically. That means they don't have to uh, file a court petition. They don't have to go through the hearing process. They don't have to pay any um, fees. Um, but because this is a process that's going to happen automatically, there's tighter restrictions on what's eligible and how many convictions can be sealed. So after seven years, um, the lowest level misdemeanors are going to be sealed automatically. Those are mostly traffic cases or, you know, the low level DNR type cases. You know, you're fishing without a permit, you're in a park after the curfew, that sort of stuff. Um, higher level misdemeanors, you can get up to four of those sealed through this process, and then up to two nonviolent felonies. No assaultive or violent crimes are eligible for automatic expungement. That was a priority for the legislative sponsors uh, to make sure all those cases go through the uh, petition process. So the automatic is really focused on nonviolent crimes. Um, and, and really it was intended to sort of focus on the easy cases. 
Um, so we could scale out expungement of those and, and focus judicial resources on the harder cases, which involve more serious convictions and more convictions generally, including assaulted ones. Um, we've seen some impact estimates for this law. Um, I, the projections, the best projections we think are that half a million, two million people will see, see, see their criminal records sealed as a result of the automatic expungement. Uh, that just to put that in perspective, that's five to 10% of Michigan's population. And it's more like 15% of working age adults, 15 to 20%. So it's a really significant improvement on uh, the status quo. So I'm gonna start now with some pointers on how to navigate the petition process. And I'm also after that gonna um, brief you guys on legal resources that are available to help people navigate this process. Um, so this is a picture of the court form that people need to apply for expungements on. It's uh, MC227, it's available on the state court's website. And it's called the application to set aside convictions. Um, so I recommend um, people do the following diligence when they're looking at applying. This is general advice. It's not legal advice. Um, you know, Safe and Just Michigan is not a legal services provider, but we are sharing what we know about the new laws um, so that people can help uh, navigate them on their own or with assistance of counsel. So the first thing to be aware of is that iChats, which are the public search of the state police database, those can be incomplete. And the main issue there is the lowest level convictions, which in many cases are traffic cases, they do not get consistently fingerprinted at the local level. And what that means is that because the state police database is structured around electronic fingerprints, those are not uploaded in a way that the state police database understands. So it's always best practice to check local court records in addition to the iChat before a person applies because the local court records are gonna be the most accurate resource. Um, it's really important to confirm eligibility. Among other things, if a petition is denied, a person can't reapply for three years. So making sure you are in fact eligible and have everything filled out correctly is really important. Um, and there's, I'm gonna talk later, but there's, there's a bunch of legal assistance tools that can help with that. Um, third, it's really important to confirm what court or courts issued the convictions. So the way this process works is if you have convictions in Macomb, Wayne, Oakland, and Washtenaw counties, you need to file a petition in each of those courts. There's no statewide petition. It's, it's county by county specific. So particularly for people with traffic cases, auto automatic expungement is going to be a better option. Um, if, if there's multiple jurisdictions that have convictions for you. Um, another issue to pay attention to with the petition process is unpaid fines and fees. In, in the neighborhood of half of everyone with records has unpaid fines and fees or restitution, and many judges across the state will deny petitions if a person has not paid off all their criminal justice debt, or if it looks to that judge like the person is not trying to do that. So, we recommend people pay off that debt um, before applying if they can, or try and get on a payment plan because that's gonna help persuade a judge to grant the petition. Um, finally, just people need to be really careful about the eligibility criteria, everything that needs to go into the application. Um, and finally, it's, it's important to prepare for the hearing because the judge is gonna wanna see that a person um, has recognized um, what they did was wrong and isn't gonna, um, isn't going to engage in that kind of activity anymore. So the judge like the judges often like to ask people sort of what have you done in the last five years to you know make yourself a better person? What have you done to pay back your debt to society? What have you done to you know give back to the community? So some judges, I know this is something that uh, Judge Thomas in Detroit likes to ask. You know, have you done community service? You know, are you volunteering at church? That kind of thing. Because it, it really is, you know, individual judges have very, very broad discretion to grant or deny these petitions. And many of them sort of want to see a person really putting effort in to show they've changed. So that's something for people need to be aware of. Um, I guess the only other thing I'd mention about the petition process is that because eligibility has expanded really significantly this year, we don't have data on um, approval rates for the new petitions. So 
I think we are expecting in some cases judges will grant fewer petitions because eligibility criteria is much broader now. So, you know, for seeing people with with multiple felonies and a lot of misdemeanors on their records, I do expect that some judges will not be granting petitions that look like that. And that is their prerogative. Um, so that's something to be aware of for people as well. Um, the marijuana process is significantly simpler. There's a lot of procedural steps um, and filing steps that don't need to happen with marijuana. And there's also less judicial discretion to deny petitions. So really the judge only needs to make a determination that a person has a conviction, a misdemeanor conviction that's currently eligible to be sealed under the new law. So one of the things we've noticed since these new laws have gone into effect is that the marijuana petitions can be uh, moved through the process a lot faster. In fact, um, literally hundreds of these petitions um, were granted in a day in Flint last week. We, we were at that event. Um, props to the Attorney General's office and the Genesee County Sheriff and Nation Outside for putting together a really great event. I heard that uh, by the end of the day, 1,200 people went through the process and either got their records sealed or filed petitions for sealing. So that's really terrific. You know, given that there's 3,000 expungements granted annually in Michigan, to have almost a third of those granted in a day is real progress. So we're, we're excited to see that effort. And my understanding is that the Attorney General's office is looking for other cities to do similar events in. So, um, you know, please keep an eye out for those. Um, so here's what we're working on now and sort of what to look for going forward with um, expungement policy. So I mentioned earlier, the automatic expungement is not in effect yet. Um, and it's not scheduled to be in effect until 2023. We do think there's interest within the legislature in making it possible for counties that are able to move forward with the automatic um, sooner to do that. Um, so I'd expect some legislation related to that issue. There's some technical fixes. Some of the language that was um, added in this bill package has created confusion around some of the waiting periods. So that we'd like to clean up some of that. And then there's, there's active legislation to include first offense drunk driving in the list of eligible offenses. Um, there was actually a bill to do this that passed last year. The governor did, chose not to sign it. So it's moving again. Um, and the expectation is that this year, um, uh, the governor will sign the bill if passed. So that would be a really significant expansion. Again, there's about 33,000 drunk driving convictions in Michigan every year. And, you know, that, it, that is a conviction that employers do not look kindly on. You know, it really does create significant barriers for people. And there's just a huge amount of people out there that have these convictions on their record. Um, like our, our, I've seen in the reporting about 200,000 people would benefit from a law making first offense drunk driving eligible. Um, Cause there's a lot of people that, you know get one DUI and don't get another one in their lifetime. You know, certainly there's people that uh, drunk, drive drunk all the time and have multiple convictions. That's not the population this legislation's targeted at um, but we shouldn't treat everybody as if they are drunk driving all the time. They haven't you know, address that issue in their lives. So this is, I think, a very common sense um, piece of legislation. If you all have, know people who have a drunk driving conviction on their record, let them know that this is happening. Tell them to call their, their representatives and call the governor's office to make sure this gets done this year. Um, in addition, we are working with um, state agencies and local courts to implement the automatic expungement law. We've got some national partners who are working in Pennsylvania and Utah who are going to help with that. Um, we're also doing a lot of public education and outreach. Um, I, I've, this is my second presentation today. And Josh and Rick are doing presentations of their own on separate tracks. Um, we're really just trying to get the word out as broadly as we can to folks in the business community, impacted people, uh, labor organizations who can connect people in need to resources to benefit from these new laws. And there's actually a lot of great legal resources out there, and I'm going to talk about a few of them and then take questions. Um, 
So we have a partnership with Legal Aid statewide. We actually are helping fund a couple positions at Legal Aid to focus on expungement. Um, and Legal Aid has the expertise to do this work. They've coordinated pro bono fairs across the state in recent years, and they've got you know, dozens of attorneys who are experts on expungement. Um, their resources are focused on people who are, who are um, making within 200% of the federal poverty line. So for a family of four, that's 60,000. Um, for folks that fall above that, we recommend um, contacting Michigan Legal Help, which is, it's actually a project of legal aid and has a lot of the legal aid expertise um, incorporated into it, but it, it provides limited live legal assistance. It's, it's more focused on providing resources for people to file petitions themselves or evaluate their eligibility before they go talk to a private attorney. Um, Michigan Legal Help also does online and phone intake for legal aid statewide. So if a person is looking to get connected to their local legal aid office, the Michigan Legal Help website and hotline are good ways of doing that. Um, for people that are based in the city of Detroit, um, Detroit has free expungement services through the mayor's office. It's called Project Clean Slate. Um, and they've done a great, a great job over the last number of years helping to move people through the process. They've helped hundreds of people get expungements in Detroit. And it's, it is sorely needed there, as, as you probably guessed from the numbers I mentioned earlier. Um, I think the challenge there is just there's overwhelmed with demand. Last time I talked to them, they've got 5,000 people on the wait list and they're requiring people to have their fines and fees paid off before they're eligible for the wait list. So it's just, it's a real challenge to serve everybody um, through this process. So legal aid is probably a better target for people that are interested, just because the Project Clean Slate folks have a huge amount of work on their plate already. Um, finally, if, if any of your organizations uh, are interested in uh, partnering on an expungement fair, um, these are the contacts for the regional legal aid pro bono coordinators. Um, usually what legal aid does for expungement fairs is they reach out to the um, local bar association and local law firms to get pro bono lawyers trained up and available to staff an event. So connecting with legal aid is a good way to get that process started. And we're, you know, we're doing this as well. And um, we're also trying to help bring um, expungement fairs together statewide. So uh, if you'd rather uh, reach out to us and work with us to plan things with legal aid, we're happy to do that. Um, my contact information is on the last slide here. Please feel free to reach out to me directly or email info at safeandjustmi.org. Uh, we've got a, a long list of um, people that have reached out that we're working on following up with to plan events like this that are you know, informational or actual expungement fairs. Uh, the fairs are a lot more work, so we're doing more of these, but you know, we're, we're also very interested in, in having the fairs because they really can directly benefit a lot of people in a short amount of time. So with that, I am going to stop screen sharing and see about um, what questions we may have, if any. Thank you. I don't see any questions at present. For our viewers, I'll remind you to put questions in the Zoom Q&A, or if you're on Facebook, uh, we're watching for questions as well. I have to say the numbers that you presented are really staggering, John. The numbers of citizens that would help in our state, uh, specific communities. Yeah, it's it surprised me too, to be quite honest. And the the as you guys may have guessed from the presentation, you know, the these numbers are a little hard to come by. You know, there's national estimates of 80 million people. You frequently hear the figure one in three people has some kind of a criminal record, but you know, the, there's a lot that isn't known about the details. Um, what we do know is that many, many people in Michigan, probably between one in four and one of three working age adults has a criminal conviction. In a lot of cases, that's gonna be a misdemeanor it's going to be traffic. It could be marijuana possession. It could be something low level, but it also could be something serious. And, you know, about one in four people with records have a felony conviction. And, and those are the ones that create the greatest barriers in society. Um, and I, I can understand why um, business owners 
might be reticent to hire someone with felonies, but you know, the research is really clear that if a person has stayed out of trouble for five years or more, that person is not more likely than a member of the general public who hasn't gotten in, into trouble to commit a crime. And that's very clear from the research that came out of University of Michigan last year. Um, they looked at, I think it was 10 years of expungement data in Michigan. So a very large sample size. And, you know, the, the reality was, you know, people who stay, manage to stay out of trouble for years and go through the expungement process are just not public safety threats any more than a member of the public is. And because of that, it's really important for us to line up our public policy around record sealing with what the facts actually tell us about recidivism. And that's not something that's been done historically because it was really hard to get records sealed. You know, there's, there's nothing in law that requires the government to keep permanent public records of a, people's, of a person's conviction. That's a policy choice the government has made historically. And you know, I think in the 60s when the expungement law was created, there were just so many fewer convictions. There was a much smaller percentage of the population had convictions. And, and those convictions just weren't as accessible. Like a, an employer would have had to go to the local court and ask that court whether the person they're um, looking to hire has a criminal record. And I think that's actually how the, the box to check on employment applications came to be is instead of having, instead of going to the courthouse to actually check the records, they just had people tell them. And that's an administratively easier way to do things. But over, as with the rise of the internet and background check companies, this information became readily available to any employer that wants it. And, you know, because of that, the vast majority of employers do background checks. And, you know, there's obviously law on negligent hiring that encourages business owners to do those things. Because um, if you didn't look for a record, the failure to find that record does seem somewhat negligent. I, I think it's important to reassure business owners that the failure to look is usually the problem with negligent hiring. If you've done a background check, if you've looked at the facts and circumstances of the conviction, if that person has stayed out of trouble for a number of years, the likelihood that you're gonna get any kind of negligent hiring blowback is really, really low. And I, I think that is not well understood within the business community. And certainly, you know, hiring managers, HR professionals, general counsels are, um, I know this as, I, I used to be a corporate lawyer <laughs> before I went into this line of work. Uh, you know, it's, they're, they're often seen as the no people, they're risk averse, they want to, you know, help the, the company do risk management, but there's, you know, common sense evidence-based risk management, and there's um, blanket policies that aren't based on evidence, and I think historically we've seen a lot more of the latter than the former. So, you know, the Society for Human Resource Management has really great resources on these issues. Um, we actually did a webinar with Johnny Taylor, their president and CEO, last summer. Um, and uh, that's available on our YouTube page if anybody's interested. Um, we also have a resource page specific to expungement issues. It lists all the legal resources it, uh, that I have in my presentation, as well as others. Um, and we can make that available to folks after the uh, webinar. Um, I, I've got a couple caveats as well. We, we sort of get similar kinds of questions asked in many presentations. And I just wanna run through a few of those momentarily since we don't have anything live from the audience. So first of all, this expungement law is only about convictions from Michigan state courts. So if you have a federal conviction, this cannot help you. If you've got out of state convictions, you gotta look at what those state policies are. Um, and because this is the most, um, this is the broadest expungement policy in the country right now. There's, there's some other states that are trying to do better now, but um, other state policies are almost certainly going to be harder to navigate and narrower than what Michigan's is. So I, I'd recommend people focus on cleaning up their Michigan records and just, you know, being honest with employers about what's, what's going on in their out-of-state records because those out-of-state records will show up in the vast majority of background checks. You know, a commercial background check, which is I think about 90% of employers use, you know, from Checker or Lexis or another provider, those are gonna have all 50 states and the federal government. So um, 
your expungement in Michigan entitles you to say you don't have any convictions in Michigan. It does not entitle you to say that you don't have any federal or out-of-state convictions. So that nuance is important and it's something that may come up for people um, in, in, in the employment process. Um, you know, particularly people, if you live near Ohio or if you live near Indiana, um, there's a decent chance you might've gotten some kind of a criminal case in one of those states. I think that's something that, particularly if it's old, employers will be willing to work with people on, but you know, that's still gonna be out there for people and it adds a layer of complexity uh, to some of these issues. John, uh, we really appreciate the time that you've taken to unpack this topic for our constituents and to understand it, understand how it affects them and why they should pay attention. Uh, thank you to Josh and Rick as well. We appreciate you sharing your stories and your point of view. I also wanted to thank uh, Jared Rodriguez from Main Street Legislative Services for introducing us, bringing us together. Uh, thank you. It's an important topic and we really appreciate you unpacking it today. Hey, thanks so much for having us. And if, if anyone does have questions or um, 